Savvy Business Radio, drawing out the best from our guests with our host, Christina Nichman. Our guest today is Larry Sharp, Libertarian candidate for Governor of New York and Andrew Cuomo's main opponent. Larry Sharp is a Bronx native, a Marine Corps veteran, entrepreneur, and management consultant with 15 years' experience mentoring international executives, entrepreneurs, and salespeople. Today we talk about small businesses, family, and education. Find out more about Larry and support his campaign at Larry Sharp, that's with an E, dot com. Hi, Larry Sharp. Welcome to Savvy Business Radio. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. I'm so glad you had me on. Oh, my gosh. I'm so blessed to have you here today. Thank you so I'm much. Blessed. I like that. <laughs> yes, we had some bit of a technical issues the first time around, but I'm so blessed you came back to share. You are running for a candidate candidate for governor for New York. I am officially the libertarian candidate for the governor Woo! of New York and... I may also wind up getting a couple other parties. It's also possible a foreign party may pick me also. So I may Ooh. have two or three lines. It is all possible. Yes. Wow. I didn't know you could do that, actually. That you could. Yes. Have... In New York State, we have what's called fusion, okay. which means you can run in multiple parties. And many of the bigger parties will do it. Mm -hmm. um, they'll have two or three lines. And so I may also have two or three lines. I'm actually the only real third party choice in New York State if you want to go third party. Oh, and you certainly should. You absolutely should. I mean, we started this particular segment, Heartbeat of the World, which you're, this is what you're on. And it's really uh, the segment to bring to our listeners, the business owners, um, because we were having people come on after the election, really upset about what happened, some happy, but all kind of, this is my favorite team member. And I'm thinking, this is our country we're talking about, not our favorite team we're playing. This is not baseball, basketball, some favorite ball game. This is our country and our freedom we're talking about. And let's stop fighting about our favorite candidate and this and well, that. No, we have to change the way we think about government. And in general, government right now, whether you're on the left, or the right is, is about how do I enforce the will of the majority? Mm -hmm. That's what the government is about now. And then we create, we create laws and rules and regulations based upon my side, whatever my side might happen to be. And then I enforce my will upon the others. The left wins and it begins to grab and, and decide to put its will upon the others. And then the right wins and the right imposes its will upon the others. And we see that been happening back and forth at our national level, Obama and um, Trump. Mm -hmm. And we see it happening here in New York State and other states that are heavily red or heavily blue. Yeah. They begin to crush the other in their state. If you live in a red state, the red state begins to crush the blue. If you live in a blue state, the blue state begins to crush the red. But government should not be about imposing its will. Government should be about protecting the rights of the individual to include the small business owner. And if you begin to protect the individual, then the rights of that individual become more important and we become socially more tolerant, mm -hmm. we become socially stronger, and we will create our own institutions. And we always do. We will create our local churches, civic associations, hobby, hobby groups. It's what we do. If they're if the government wasn't so strong upon us, it, would, it wouldn't be like we'd all of a sudden go crazy. We would create our own smaller, more local institutions. And we do it anyway. And actually, that is what it was meant for us all to get involved and, and create the world we want to see, to create the community we want to be part of, not to feel that we're a victim and, and where a government or organization is running our lives. We don't want that. And I've heard far too often, including myself over the years, why should I even bother to vote? It doesn't make a difference. Well, about 70% of New Yorkers don't vote. I mean, it's a mass amount of people to vote. In some, in certain counties in New York State, one out of seven vote. That's how bad it is. I mean, we really have given up. It's actually a thing called learned helplessness. We've actually been, we just, over time, I've said, why bother? Yeah. And one of the biggest reasons and what I work on often and one of my biggest campaign issues is the idea of unfunded mandates. And what that means is in my, in my state, New York, Albany is our capital. So either Albany decides that you must buy, must do, must pay for these things. And also the federal government, Washington decides, Washington DC decides you must pay for, you must do all these things. Now it's a big problem when you're in a local community and 90% of your budget is mandated by someone else. Well, you don't have control of your budget. So we have a lot of problems. Problem number one is why bother showing up? Because you can't really do anything. Your, your county or your local township is actually being run by either your state capital or the, the the federal capital, either one. So hardly anyone shows up. You have a situation where five people happen to show up at the meeting, and therefore 
Those five are in charge because they showed up. That's the reason. And that's happening all over the place. You have a lot of places where you literally can't find people to fill spots. So someone is the vice chair and treasurer because you literally can't get enough bodies to show up. Now, here's the next part. When does someone show up to local, local government? When they're angry. So three people show up because the parking lot is too big or too small or the, the stop sign fell down or whatever is the problem. Or they're tearing up my road, insert thing here. And so what happens is now the only time these four or five people who are dedicated and showed up see anybody is when they're angry. Mm-hmm. So now it naturally becomes us versus them. And that's happening all over New York State to where the small elites go in the back room, make some rules, come out, and then announce them like the royal edict and people are unhappy. That's happening again and again and again. Yeah. But I have to go even further with this. And that is sometimes the mandates are so big you can't get anything else or even the mandates are stronger than the actual, bigger than the actual budget because you have a county that has one third of its population on Medicare, one third on Medicaid, and in New York State, we're losing 100,000 people every year leaving the state. So our tax base is dropping. So now how do you raise money? There are only two ways to do so. One of them is to raise property taxes because in New York State is a loophole to where the public doesn't vote on property taxes, only the leadership does. Mm. So they go behind closed doors, declare an emergency, and then raise property taxes past our 2%, which is supposed to have a 2% cap, they go past. The second way is they use law enforcement and or licensing as a profit center. So they then decide cops go out and now parking tickets are not 100 bucks, they're 300 bucks. And speeding tickets aren't 50 bucks, they're 500 bucks. And all of a sudden now they're gonna raise money or worse, you, you want to start a business? Great. There's a licensing fee to walk a dog or to braid hair. I'm not joking. Those are actual licenses in New York State. So now they start licensing. And when they start licensing, let me be very clear. Licensing sounds amazing because it sounds like, well, you get a license. That means you're trained or better. That's not what it is. Licensing has no actual bearing on safety or anything. It is only about control and raising money. That's it. I have a rule on licensing, and that is, general rule, would you ask your friend to do it? And let me ask you, I'll ask you, would you ask your friend to braid your hair? <laughs> no. You wouldn't ask your friend to braid your hair? No, I don't like braids, sorry. <laughs> no, but right, I'd ask him to you, do something else, like my taxes. Okay, but... hold on. What if you wanted your hair braided? Okay. Would you ask your friend to do it? Yes. Okay, if yes. Like. If you wanted your hair braided, you would ask your friend, right? Yeah. Do you have a dog? Yes. Okay. Would you ask your friend, if you couldn't, would you ask a friend to walk your dog? Yes. And I have. Yes. And there's a license for these two things. Don't you, you ask your friend, don't get a license. Let me ask you one more thing. Would you ask your friend to remove your gallbladder? Oh, heck no. I don't then get so. a license. Fine. No problem. <laughs> get a license for that then. That's my point. That's what we should be looking at. If there is something like that, if you wouldn't ask your friend to do it, if you wanted it, then... Get a license. If you'd ask your friend, go. All licensing does is punish the little guy. It is a barrier to entry for the small business. And the guy or gal who starts a dog walking business or who starts a um, a hair braiding business or starts cutting hair, they're not millionaires. Mm-mm. They're people who are trying to start their life over, start something new. They've lost their job. They have a felony. They're just out of, out of drug rehab. They're out of high school. They've dropped out of college. They're not millionaires who have tons of money. They're people who either want to restart or have had problems or a combination. That's who they are. And we are shutting them down with unnecessary licensing and regulations. Yeah. Because really what a license is, like all things, it's it's another form of tax, tax on the people. And we are being taxed to death. Uh, property tax, uh, something that, and this is something we've talked about off air and it bugs me a little bit. It, well, a lot of it actually is that you could purchase your house, house full out, you know, saved and really been good, pay off your mortgage. And you don't really own your house because at any time you can't pick up on your taxes, lose your job and you can't pay the taxes, the property tax, you are out in the street. That house get, goes into foreclosure. It's taken by the banks and the state and you do not have that house. That's not owning anything. Yes. Yeah. And no, I completely agree. And the issue is, Here's the problem, though, right? You you have a budget in New York State. It's about $170 billion, give or take. Mm-hmm. And you've got 100,000 New Yorkers leaving every single year. Um, so our tax base is going down. The worst part about that is 
New York City's population is about staying the same or getting higher, which means all that hundred thousand is coming from Western New York, Central New York, North Country, Capital District, all upstate. That's where it's all coming from. So they are losing population, and worse, they're losing the youth. It's youth flight. There are people who are getting their education and leaving, or getting education someplace else, and not coming back. The average farmer in New York is over 55 years old. That's a problem. Now, when that begins to happen, well, your tax base goes down, which means you have to raise taxes some other way. This becomes a problem. I want to raise money without, without raising taxes, and I want to cut spending. Those two things. People say, Larry, you can't cut spending. It's impossible because New Yorkers expect a certain amount of services.、Mm -hmm. But those hundred thousand people, they're all going to states with smaller budgets and less taxes. They're going to Florida. Florida has more people than New York has and half the budget. So many New Yorkers are going to the Carolinas. The Carolinas have a name for us. They call us halfbacks. No, really. We move to Florida and halfway back, halfbacks. <laughs> That's how many New Yorkers are flooding to the Carolinas. It's true. This is a problem. So how do we do this? We have to find new ways of raising money without taxes. Here's one idea off the bat, and this one I love, and this is se selling naming rights to infrastructure. Huh? We have bridges right now in New York State. One of them is called the Mario Cuomo Bridge. I want to vomit. We've named it after our aristocracy, after our royal family, the Cuomo family. That's embarrassing. How about instead we name that bridge after I don't know Sprint or Staples or KeyBank well, or、radio. insert thing here. <laughs> yes, if you're able to do that, they do it with stadiums already, right?、Mm -hmm. Now they pay ten million dollars a year for some stadiums, and these stadiums are used half of the year. Can you imagine how much they pay for a bridge that will be mentioned every single morning in the New York City metro area every single day on ten to fifty different media outlets? The traffic on the Staples Bridge is X, Y, and Z. They would pay tens of millions of dollars for that. Of course, they would. These are companies that spend literally billions, b billions of dollars on marketing in general. This is a drop in a bucket for them to give us fifty to one hundred million for a year.、Mm -hmm. But on top of that, they control maintenance and no tolls. Tolls go away to save the middle class because the middle class is paying tolls left and right. And even better, an extra bonus. Now they run the maintenance, which means the crony capitalists who get their buddies to get all of the 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 jobs to do terrible maintenance work that goes away because Staples is not going to put up with it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love no this. No more crony capitalism. That is awesome. Now, do you see a vision for how maybe small small businesses can play a part in, in increasing the? In the a hundred percent. There are several ways we can help out small businesses. And I'll touch three, and then one a bonus that is it has to do with the part I just talked about. But the three that have nothing to do with infrastructure. The three are one: we need to simplify the tax code.、Mm -hmm. The tax code must be simplified. Simple tax code means two things: one, the bigger businesses will actually pay their fair share. The reason why they don't pay the same as small business is because a detailed, complicated tax code means if you have the money to pay attorneys. And accountants, you don't pay taxes. That's how come Amazon cannot pay taxes, right? They know how to get through the loopholes. The small guy doesn't, so he gets hammered and pays actually more percentage-wise than a big business. How about we all get screwed the same? It's a whole <laughs> lot better and fairer. Let's make a level playing field. That's number one. But number two, because the big guys have all the accountants and attorneys, they don't get hit with fines. The little guys do because they mess up and they get hit with fines. It's so complex. But a fine for a little guy might put him out of business.、Mm. So I know many people who've gone into business, and the last thing was the tax bill or the tax fine, and that crushes them. So that goes away because it's simple. So simplify the tax code first. You don't have to raise any taxes. Simplify the tax code, and you will find big business will pay its fair share, and small business won't be penalized and punished. That's one. Number two. Create an environment to where, if a business, and this, by the way, includes farmers, if you include farmers in this, create an environment to where, when you have farmers and small businesses who agree to only sell their product or service within New York State, you create a law, which is already happening in Wyoming, by the way. I'm copying Wyoming, where you are now immune from federal regulatory bodies. What's that mean? 
That means if there's federal regulations that affect your industry, you do not have to pay attention to them because you're not selling across state lines. Ooh, that's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Now, big businesses always sell across state lines. That's why they're big business. So they will have to follow those regulations. You as a small business will not. It's a small advantage you will get depending upon what your business is. This will heavily help local farmers and also help small businesses that are, local, that are, that are localized in their counties. It will help things like daycare centers and things of that sort that are not going to go across state lines, right? Local stores, things like retail. It helps all of them. Local manufacturers that only sell to local areas. It will help the small business owner. Now, once that small business owner wants to go across border, that means they're getting bigger and that's great. And they can then prepare effectively to deal with whatever the federal regulations will be. But it gives them a chance to get to that level without having to deal with it right away. But, but wait, there's even more. Wow. Uh, yes, there's it. more. Yes, there's even more. And that is, I want to give small businesses a big advantage if they want to hire people who have had a criminal background. The reason I bring this up is most of the time when it comes to small businesses, they hire people who they know. Often the owner is part of the hiring process. They can meet and get to know people. If they hire people who they know and who have uh, felony convictions uh, for the first two years, those people pay no um, state uh, payroll tax. Hmm. Now, now, what happens is it allows them to hire people who are at, at, a, at a lower rate because they're not paying state income, the state income tax, a state, I'm sorry, state payroll tax. And it gives an opportunity to actually get people back off their, you know, off of the, the bad street and back into the right street, right, the right path. Mm -hmm. So you, people tell me, but Larry, then people will just hire felons and won't ever pay payroll tax. Good. Then you're training my, my felon population. That's what I want. Give people a fair chance. Yes. But I think because they will know the people, it'll be more of a one-on-one -on -one chance. They can say no or say yes. And people have a chance of having the support system they need and giving someone a chance to get better. So I will add that aspect also. If you have 50 or less employees, you can do that. So the last piece, which goes all the way back to our infrastructure piece, I will also like to have things like you the adopt the highway idea where you adopt the highway and a, and a small business or a large business pays to clean a highway. We can also do adopt the highway for the signs on the highways and on the local roads and allow small local businesses to sponsor those. They pay for the signage, they're responsible for the signage, and their logo goes on all the signage. That's great. And it's so there are lots of ways. You there, there's lots of opportunities to help small businesses and hence help the community. Not everyone listening in is a business owner, but there are a lot because it's a business show. But people who are not a business owner, so that's great for the business owner. But what I've told people before on the show is if your small business owners in your community are doing well, you do well. It, it, we're all one big community. So when they're flourishing, we all flourish. I personally have been excited to support in my local area here, local businesses, our local coffee shop and assorted um, grocery stores that are local and not connected to a huge grocery store. It's, it feels like family and we, we can all, you know, help the community grow that much more. Now, one of the things that came up from our listenership as being very important because a lot of our listeners have children is helping our, our children. Now you mentioned a little bit about felons and helping them get back on track because a lot of our kids, Hey, you smoke pot once and you get picked up by the police. Should that show up on your record and like ruin your life forever? The, there's None. so many things that we could deal with to help our kids. And there's three general rules. One of them is family court. The second one is education system. And the third one is our criminal justice system, which is not a criminal justice system. It's a criminal punishment system. Yeah. So it's three. And I'm sorry, I could talk for hours on this. So I'll try to be, I'll try to be a uh, uh, shorter if I can. Family court. Family court is crushing our families. And I would argue it's the number one issue because if you have better family courts, you will have more fathers in the household. You will have less angry people fighting each other. You have less broken children and therefore you have less criminals and you'll have more people being successful in business relationships. Family court is a critical issue. I was just dealing with this, believe it or not, the other day. I was at a place in Elmsford dealing with father's rights issues. Mm -hmm. And the issue in family court is, I don't know if you know this, but if you're in family court and you lie, it is not a crime. Mm -hmm. It's not perjury. Mm -hmm. So people are encouraged to lie and hurt and destroy each other. And we have horrible, horrible divorces. And the people who pay are always the kids. We have to revamp family court. One, by making the priority in family court always being the child, not the money. Mm -hmm. Money is important. Absolutely. It just should be secondary. 
Primary should be the child being with his or her kin. That is number one. Secondary should be the money. Of course, there, it's valuable. That should be primary. It's not the case. Mm -hmm. Second, lying in family court should be perjury and punishable. And if lawyers encourage that, they should lose their license and their ability to practice in New York State. It should be devastatingly punishment for them to end their careers. They're bad people. They should not do it. And the last and the last piece is right now, judges look at family court, many of them, not all, too many of them view it as a place where they shouldn't be. They use it to go to the next level. They don't seem to care. And it should be important. Wow. Uh, that's first. That's family law. Um, I, I'm, I'm really stopping because this we went through divorce as a child and and the whole as you were just talking about the family courts are horrible and we've had yes. a couple of people on in the past who are divorce counselors or mediators it's gotten to a point where it's nuts that that is used yes. means to grow a business and to use the court system to to mediate family problems when really the court should have nothing to do with me being a family mediator the judge and this is something i didn't know the judge just hears the information before him on what's going on with his family very minimal information, just what's presented to him and makes a ruling. This is not a criminal case. He cannot know the intricate of what the children are going through, what's going on in the family home. Of course not. And I, yep. I just kind of think that the family court should not exist. Like this sort of thing should be outside of the No, I, I disagree on that aspect. Okay. Look, if people need a mediator to go to court, I'm, I'm not against that. But the entire system has to be completely rebooted. Hmm. Yeah. It has to be totally rebooted. I mean, if... if if people should be able to mediate, I agree, but they should also be able to go to court if they want to. My point is, it's it's not that it shouldn't exist, but it shouldn't be mandatory. Ah, oh, okay, I get you. I get you. Right? It should be mandatory. For some families, that's the only way it's going to work. And I'm okay with that <laughs> if you want to use it. Yeah. But even if you want to use it, it shouldn't be set up the way it is. It must be rebooted completely. It's a disaster. And it's crushing our families, which is crushing everything else. Absolutely. So that's number one for our kids. Number two for our kids is education. Education should not be K through 12. It should be K through 10. Hmm. At 16, kids should leave high school and it should be finished. You have four things you can do after after K through 10. And this is kind of already happening in certain areas. You have BOCE, CTE, things where kids can go to trade schools if they want to go to trade schools. Trade schools are wonderful. You want to go to trade school? Go. I'm happy if you want to go, but just go. Right now, people look at trade school often as, oh, she can't get into college. Oh, he isn't that smart. And that's embarrassingly stupid. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's demonstrably wrong. College is a great way to have success, but it is just that. A great way, not the great way. A lot of people should not go to college. How do we know that? Because mo a bunch, a big chunk of our children right now are taking their last years of high school. They're doing gym and study hall and smoking weed and playing video games. <laughs> you know it's been true. So do I. And how do I know that? Because most colleges, their first year is now 13th grade. Whoa. Because no one's ready for college. So we wait two years of them smoking weed and playing video games, send them off to college and wonder, why are they bad students? Well, you just gave them two years of bad habits. What do you expect? Then it takes them six years to graduate a a college, which is the average now, if they even graduate college. Six years is the average. So they're 24 years old with a degree that has zero value and they've never had a boss and we wonder why they have a bad work ethic. We set them up that way. Yeah. And come I have an idea. Instead, at 16, you have four choices. Choice one, go to trade school. Good for you. Become a plumber, become a carpenter, whatever motivates you. That's awesome. Go do that. And you'll find that lots of people who do that by the time they're 24, they're not lost working at Starbucks with a college degree and debt. Instead, they're making six figures a year as a plumber and they're happy as can be. So that's step one. <laughs> step two, if you want to go to college, you like college, you want to go to college, you want to specialize school, awesome. Take two years off. That's your, that's your time to go to an actual prep school. Go to a prep school so that when you show up day one in college, you are ready to rock and roll and you can get the most out of your degree and you can get those A's and not just learn, but also implement. Yeah. Be the incubator, be what you need to be in school, do stuff and get the most out of your college experience. Go to two years of prep school. You don't want to do that? No worries. You can instead go right to college. You're brilliant? Go right to college. I love it. Some people can. Go. Why waste two years? Go to college. If you're not that, no worries. Get a job. Just go to work. Go to work. Learn how to, how to work and how to show up at nine o'clock, how to have a boss. Get a work ethic. Let's use those two years, 17, 18 years old, as a real rite of passage for our youth. Get them to understand what's right and what's wrong, how, what they'll like, what they'll enjoy. And work. We ha literally have laws in the books from when we were worried if kids would get caught in, you know, a bobbin factory accident or get stuck in a loom 
What is wrong with us? <laughs> Who cares if some 16-year-old goes to work? Good. And not just that. A 16-year-old can work at a lower salary because they're living at home. Let them go work. Learn the value of a job. Go out there and do it. The response I get all the time is, but Larry, they're 16. Yeah. What if they make a mistake? So. Good. Make the mistake at 16, not at 26. Exactly. Make it now. Not just that. You know how many 20-year-olds, 20-somethings I talk to who tell me, Larry, I don't feel like an adult? Because we've never made them feel like an adult. Start at 16. Learn. By the time you're 18, 19, 20, 22, you're rocking and rolling. You kind of know what you want to do. Look, the average American is going to have five careers, not five jobs, five careers. Let's get them started on the right path with the right work eth ethic, with decision-making ability when they're 16, 17, 18, so they can be successful and happy. I love it. I, I love it. I love that, Larry. Yes. And what, I, what I'm really loving about it is that it's giving them a choice and treating them with responsibility. And is it like they're an adult? I mean, my my mom, yes. uh, my mom and dad, my dad came from Germany. My mom was here, the second generation German. But they believed, hey, get off your butt, your lazy little butt. And as early as we could walk, you're supposed to be helping with the chores. There's no allowance for yep. this. You live here. You participate as a family and you help. And when I was, I think, 13, I was doing babysitting for neighbors and getting paid for it with my first paycheck. Yep. But I mean, th I think that is one of the things I know parents want the best for their children, but kind of coddling on them that they shouldn't touch their, and do anything with their hands. Let me do it, everything for you. It doesn't allow them to be prepared to do things for themselves, you know, maybe balance their checkbook or or go into the workforce, like you said, be ready to start at 9 a.m. and know what that's like, that I'm, I'm to be responsible. I'm here to be on time and to give my best my best work. Yes. But I also like the idea um, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And a lot of my friends were going to college and just to go to college when you don't have a vision or, or focus or direction. Disaster. Almost. Yeah. For me right now, it just seems like a waste of money when you yes. could go out there, start to get a job or explore different things. I like apprenticeships, perhaps, you know, going to try a different job and, and see, would this be a position or, or an area I'd even want to be interested in, like being an intern? Well, why do we even have to have the idea that college is only for someone who's 18, 19? Yeah. I know lots of people go to college in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. College should be for whenever you want to make a change in your life, whenever that is. Again, we're going to have multiple careers. Just because I'm a plumber at 16 doesn't mean I'll be a plumber at 26. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, I'm a business owner at 26 doesn't mean I'll be one at 36. Who knows? We mix and match and we change and we do different things. I've had five careers. My wife is in her 40s and she's going to school this year to get a, get a doctorate degree to change her career. And the people do it all the time. Why do we believe in this idea that, you know, you got to spend the first 22 years of your life preparing for some career you're going to be in forever? That's a fantasy. It's an anachronism. It shouldn't exist. It's silly. Yes. Yeah. It is. It is. And that is what is happening. That is the true fact of what is happening today. I'm on my second career right here. And yep. a number of people I know are, are really growing into a new field, a new position, whatever they're being pulled to, their gifts and talents are pulling them in a different direction. And that's okay. Um, but this is yes. this has been fabulous, Larry. We could go on for hours. I know we can't, but I yes. don't want people to leave because I know you are the next right person to be our governor of New York. How can people I love it. vote for you, find out more about you, share that with you? LarrySharp.com, E at the end of sharp, E stands for electable. <laughs> LarrySharp.com, please go there. Or you can go to Larry Sharp for New York, the Facebook page, Larry Sharp for New York YouTube page or Larry Sharp on both Twitter and on Instagram. I am all over the place. Please jump on board. Absolutely. Well, I, I thank you so much for, one, stepping out to, to run. It is not an easy thing to do for anyone, no matter what candidacy you're running for. And I thank you so much for serving. And, I mean, you are also a Marine, a veteran. Uh, you're an entrepreneur. True. You've done so much great work in New York, and I thank you so much, Larry. I know you're going to kick butt. Thank you so much for coming to Savvy Business Radio and sharing your wisdom today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming to Savvy Business Radio and sharing your wisdom today. Savvy Business Radio broadcasts worldwide via a large podcast network celebrating business owners, entrepreneurs, influencers, and successful individuals. Find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest. Call 732-474-7375 or email Christina at SavvyBusinessRadio.com.